So good to see you. Welcome to Christ Church. Glad that you have uh, made it a priority to be here, church family, uh, in all of what is going on in your lives to uh, carve out the time and to stay disciplined uh, to uh, gathering together with God's people. Uh, really thankful that you're doing that. I trust that God will uh, continue his blessing on that in your lives. And guests, thank you for being here. My name's Adam. I serve as the lead pastor here at Christ Church, and I'm uh, really thankful that you've come in, however you come, whatever brought you, whoever brought you, whatever the case, we're just thankful that you're here and uh, grateful that you have been courageous enough to step into an unfamiliar environment like this one. And uh, we trust that you'll leave here knowing we love Jesus and uh, we love one another. Those are the things that God has uh, marked us with, and we want those for you as well in your visit. Those who are online, family, we miss you, eager for your return. And uh, those who are guests checking us out online, we hope it'll lead you, if possible, to joining with us in our worship very soon. There's something unique about the gathering that needs to be a part of the believer's life. So I'm really thankful you're using that uh, opportunity online, but trusting that God will bring you here very soon. And if you're in the overflow, uh, we're thankful for you and uh, recognize that uh, that's not the first choice for any of us, but we're eager for all of God's blessings uh, through the time we have now in his word together. All right, so we're gonna jump into the word. And for these next two weeks, we have a little bit of a unique task. Every year, uh, our church runs on a calendar cycle. We start a new ministry year. You start hearing about it more and more. It starts ramping up. The ministries of our church, the rhythms of our church's life become more uh, talked about and they become a priority. Signups are in for new small groups and for uh, new studies that are gonna be opening up some of the greatest rhythms of our lives together. Serving teams are expanding and looking for uh, new uh, participants in the ministry of our church family to one another. All of that is important, and all of that every single year of our church's life has become the emphasis of this preparation week or two before we jump into the ministry year. Next weekend, we launch into our full life together as a church family, and I want to take these weeks not so much to drive home the importance of those rhythms. I believe those are biblical. We didn't have a think tank meeting to come up with the rhythms of our life as a church, those are just what the New Testament sets out as the priorities for us to worship in services together, to live in groups in community, to learn in studies. We need to be students of God's word in a serious way and then to serve on teams. We use our lives because we are the people of the servant who saved us. We are servants for Christ here in our church family and in our community. So I don't think those things are ours to hold as if we came up with them, but I also don't want to just drive them home. I, I want to present you with a theme for the entire ministry year that's on our calendar. And that theme is growing together. And the reason that that theme is pressing on my heart and on our pastoral team, our elder team's heart, is because we, we are concerned that there is a potential among us that we have a, we have a, sense of growth that is not actually connected to spiritual growth. And when you talk about church growth, I'm, most people are always talking about how many people go to the church. And Christ Church has experienced tremendous church growth. All of the 10 years of our life together that we have uh, lived as a church family have been years of numeric growth. But here's the thing, with numeric growth, there can be kind of a sense that, well, I must be growing as a disciple because I'm a part of something that's growing with disciples. The second thing that could be tempting for us to be deceived is to think that because I have been a believer a long time or I've been a part of Christ church in the rhythms of life for a long time, that I am therefore necessarily growing. Do you know that tenure is not equivalent to spiritual growth, nor is the size of the church connected directly to the growth of the disciples in the church? And we as a church family have no desire to be a giant crowd on the weekends that feels good and goes out and doesn't have any life together as a church. This is a discipleship factory. We are an outpost for discipleship until the king returns. So my concern for us together is that we set our hearts for the next two weekends on growing together so that we can be a church family not marked by confidence in our numbers and not marked by confidence in our years, but rather marked by confidence of God's work in us as disciples and among us as a gathering, one local expression of his church in this community. 
How many of you have been believers for longer than 25 years? Longer than 25 years, hands up. How many of you? Okay, well, it's a lot of us, and uh, I don't want tenure to equal growth. The work is not done, right? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, so we need to be growing together. So no matter the circumstances, some of you are here with a very difficult circumstance. You're clinging by your fingernails to your faith. Um, Life is hard and heavy. Some of you are experiencing tremendous ease and uh, tranquility in your life right now. I don't know what the circumstances are. Some of you feel as if you need to grow and some of you feel as if you don't need to grow. Whatever the case, you need to grow. In fact, if you think I don't need the series on growing together, I don't think I need to grow. You really need to grow. Like it's really for you. It's for all of us uh, together. So here's who this is for. Young, old, new, veteran, men, women, married, unmarried, parents, non-parents, perceived maturity, perceived immaturity, storms raging on your life, serenity marking your life, whether you would categorize yourself as winning, losing, warring, or regrouping spiritually, whether you would say you are suffering, succeeding, sick, or healthy, gaining, or grieving, despondent, desperate, or delivered. Whatever your adjectives would be, We must be a church family as we head into a new ministry year. In just a couple of weeks, we'll be back in our study of Gospel of John. And this is where John will lead us to be a people who are growing together. The scope, the scale, the strength of how we grow and when we grow and the speed of it all, that's as varied as there are people in the room. But growth together is the essential character of the people of God in all of their circumstances, in all of their context, no matter where they are, okay? So to begin that, we're gonna jump into Philippians chapter number two. So if you got your Bible with you, open them up. Let's go to Philippians chapter two. If you didn't bring a Bible, we've got one for you to borrow. There should be a hardback copy of the Bible somewhere nearby. Or you can look on with your neighbor there, even if you don't know them. They're gonna love it. Just look over their shoulder the whole time. (laughs) Write notes in their Bible for them. Do anything you wanna do. Let's all get into the word together, Philippians chapter two, and we're gonna call this growing. Little spoiler alert if you're taking notes. This week's growing. Next week, we got creative. It's together, okay? (laughs) So you already know what the title is, growing together uh, this week and next. And this week is growing from Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13. What does growth spiritually, true growth, genuine growth, in our lives as God's people, what does that include? And these two verses, verse 12 and 13, are so essential for our anticipation, our expectation, and our preparation for a ministry year of growth together through the rhythms of our life as a church family. So no matter if you can remember growing in the last week spiritually or whether it's been a long time, let's give our full attention to God's words and see what he has to say to us. The Apostle Paul wrote this to a little church in Philippi just like Christ Church in Gilbert. And he said in verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do, to work, what brings him pleasure, what is his good pleasure. These are God's words for us this morning. May the Spirit of God help us to get them and to be gotten by them. Here's the big idea that sits over top of our study of these two verses this morning. Jot this down. If you're taking notes, it'll help you to study right now. It'll help you to review as we head into a new week on the mission of Jesus. Growing spiritually includes two perpetual, complementary, irreplaceable disciplines. Now, those adjectives are not added in there just because we didn't meet the word quota for the big idea, so we threw in a few more words. Those are very intentional. These are perpetual. They go on for the whole life of our discipleship. They are complementary. You cannot divide them without losing their benefit. If you divide them, you will fall into two errors. I'll give those to you in just a moment. And they are irreplaceable. You cannot just plug something else in as the complementary discipline for your growth spiritually. This is how God intended for us to be a growing people. 
This is what is included in it, and I want it to come home for us so that underneath of our life in groups together, there's an anticipation, an expectation, and a pursuit of growth together. And in our learning and studies, it is so that we are growing together. And so in our serving teams, it is so that we are growing together. And in our worship services together, it's so that we are growing together. Now, the question then is, what are those two disciplines? And let me give them to you. Growing always includes these two. Number one. Growing always includes obeying God's commands to us. There is no spiritual growth as a follower of Jesus without obedience to Jesus. It is not second level Christianity. It's not graduate school discipleship. We have already read together publicly from Ephesians chapter two, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. God shaped us to be obedient to him in saving us. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul drives home to the church at Philippi. And this was a church, listen to me, this is a local church that had a tendency toward selfishness, toward not working well together, not having a great mindset toward each other. This was a church family that needed to grow together spiritually. This is not some kind of unique context, this is, This is a completely relevant context to us, Christ Church. For us to be what we have been called to be, it's going to require for us to consecrate ourselves, to devote ourselves to obeying God's commands to us. So let's dive in. Look at verse 12. It's where we find it. And verse 12 begins with the word, therefore. Now, Bible students, that's an important word. Uh, My dad became a pastor when I was five. And uh, anytime I say that to somebody, they're always like, oh, you're following the family business, huh? You know, <laughs> that's not how it works. So I'm not a pastor because my dad became a pastor. Uh, in fact, my dad becoming a pastor made me not want to be a pastor until God changed my heart and called me to be a pastor. But my dad pastor, he says something every time he comes to the word therefore in teaching the Bible. He says, wherefore is that therefore, therefore. Now you can remember that just like I can because of the rhyming of it. Wherefore is that therefore, therefore? And that's an important question. The answer is always behind it. Therefore is a pivot word in your Bible. It's always taking what's behind it to set you up for what's coming after it. So therefore is a hinge. And what is hinged here in Philippians chapter two is before this, he has just been telling the Philippian Christians that they need to think differently about each other. They need to have the mind of Christ in them toward one another. And to bring that home, he tells them again about the incarnation of Jesus who left heaven's glories, who set aside his rights to his divine power and who took on humanity, who became obedient. He was obedient all the way to death. He obeyed all the way to death and even death on a cross. And Paul can't tell him about the the incarnation and the humility of Jesus and the obedience of Jesus without talking about the exaltation of Jesus. So verses nine through 11, just behind that therefore, it's another therefore, therefore, because of the incarnation and the substitution obedience of Jesus for our salvation, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, because that's who he is and because that's what's true, Paul says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence when I was with you, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, right away, I know there's a temptation maybe for some to think that this this seems off. Work out your own salvation. Do not misinterpret this to say, work your way to salvation. That's not what he's saying. In fact, he calls them his beloved because they are his spiritual family. They are his brothers and sisters. They have received salvation as you and I have, if in fact you have placed your faith in Christ through faith in Christ. When he says, work out your own salvation, when he says, obey as you obeyed when I was there in my apostolic authority, a deliverer of the message of God. So now obey my apostolic authority in my absence, because he's writing from prison, When Paul says work out your salvation as an equivalent connection to that obedience, what he's saying for them is take what's true on the inside and let's get that on the outside. 
Prove it, work it out, show it out that you are in fact saved. Now the salvation word there, that's a, that's a great choice for the apostle Paul because it comes with a significant uh, nuance in the New Testament. Salvation is one of the words that's spoken about us that has a past, a present, and a future aspect to it. So if he would have chosen justification, that's a once and done declaration by God that you're righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen, you with me? But salvation in the Bible is spoken of as you have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. Why is that? Well, sometimes the word salvation just gets too Christianized for us. It just becomes something that doesn't have any definition anymore to us. Think of the word rescue. God rescued you, sinner. He rescued me as a sinner from his wrath, from his judgment. So when I placed my faith in Jesus, I was rescued forever from the wrath of God. And today I am being rescued from the wrath of God today. And on the day of judgment, when I stand before my creator, I will be in all the culmination of it, rescued from the wrath of God. No condemnation for those who are now in Christ Jesus. Understand? So when Paul says, work out your own salvation, what he's saying is, what has been true and is true and will be true, let that come from the inside out and obey God's commands. There is no growth spiritually without obedience. For Perhaps some of you, you feel as if you haven't grown in quite some time. All the while, keeping your little pet disobedience to God's commands like right here beside you. I don't know what's going on. I'm just not really growing. Oh, what's this? Oh, it's a fluffy little sin that I just keep there close by. No, obedience is, no matter the context, no matter if life is is going as well as it has ever gone as a disciple or whether it is as difficult as it has ever been. No matter the context, obedience is the call on us. It is the manner that is worthy of living in our calling. And then he ends it with that little phrase. Did you see that? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul likes that little phrase. He usually uses it between people who come interact with each other and they have respect for each other. So they, they react a certain way to one another. There's a bowing going on between people. That's not what he means here. He's talking about God. He's talking about this working out being marked by awe and wonder at the verses nine through 11 truth about Jesus. Listen, we are rescued from God's wrath by God's son through his self-sacrifice in our place. And he therefore, having been resurrected from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the father, he is the one who has the name above every name. He is the creator, sustainer of the universe. He is the rescuer, the redeemer. He is the one who has done it all. He has all the power. His word is his power. He is the one who says demons done and they're done. He's the one who says food for everyone and there's food for everyone. He's the one who says sickness healed and it's healed. He's the one who says it's all over. I'm going back and it's all gonna be over and he's gonna come back. He's the one who's gonna create a new heaven and a new earth for eternity for us to dwell with him. So when we work it out, listen, we are not self-confident. No swagger for us as Christians. We don't strut around in our obedience. We obey with holy reverence and awe. Oh, it's for you, Lord Jesus. And there's no one above you. I'm six foot five. Therefore, when I hear one size fits all, I just want to tell you I don't believe it. Okay, and the guys up here on the front are rolling with me. Six, six, that's what your stats used to say. Six, seven, something like that. Yeah, we don't believe it. I just wanna say, this is one of the tallest churches in America <laughs> and we don't believe it. Particularly if it zips up. If it zips up, no, no. And they always are so, the five foot 10 guy telling me is so confident. Oh yeah, it fits everybody, it fits everybody. I'm like, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. And then I zip it up. I'm like, see? And they don't want to see. <laughs> Fits all weirds tight. Perhaps you're thinking like, this can't be for me. This, is, this, isn't, this, isn't, this can't be for me. One size fits all is so uncomfortable. I want you to know this is not special. This is universal for us as God's people. Obedience to God is a part of our lives as the people of God, period. 
But hear this and be encouraged. There are as many applications of obedience as there are people and situations in this room. It is obey. And there are as many expressions of obedience to the commands of God that that there are people in this room. So we will grow at different places. Obedience will be being applied by the Holy Spirit in different spots in our lives. This is a part of being a family that's growing up together. It is not evaluating everybody else's growth based upon where God's Spirit is growing you. It is the expectation that we are all growing up in obeying the commands of God as varied in their application as there are people in here. Does that make sense? That should give us some sense of hope. Because the commands will vary that come home to us by the Spirit's work through the Word in various seasons of our life. And yet growing always includes obeying God's commands to me. Think about the categories of the commands of the Bible. Believe, think, love, endure, serve, speak, hope, kill sin. Look by faith, abide, purify, wait, walk, Work, be, let, complete, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many commands for us. Which leads me then to the concern. As I lay this before you from Philippians 2, let me give you some one-liners if you're taking notes that I trust will help you. Number one, communion with God results in obedience to God, okay? We are not obeying God outside of relationship to God. There is no working your way to salvation. There is only working out your salvation in communion with God. So in a relationship with God is where obedience to God is fostered. Communion with God results in obedience to God. Here's another one. Commands from God are loving, good, and in our best interest. Every command of God is loving, good, and in our best interest. I'm an overt rebel by nature. Tell me that I'm not allowed to do it, and I'm immediately thinking about how I could possibly do it. Tell me that I have to do it, and I'm immediately thinking, I'm not doing that. How many of you are overt rebels with me? Raise your hands. You just obeyed me. (laughs) See, when I go to church and they say, like, turn to your neighbor and say something, no way. I'm not saying it. How many of you have been saved for 25 or longer years? I'm like, well, that's me, but I'm not raising my hand. I am by nature prone to be commanded and to immediately push back. That's my flesh. That's the old me. And I want you to know that the oldest lie in the book is playing to that. The Garden of Eden lie is God doesn't love you. He's not good and he doesn't have your best interest in mind. That's why he commanded you not to eat that. So be careful to be reminded that obedience is fostered in communion and it is God's loving, good, and best interest for us, orders to us, especially those of us who are over rebels by nature. The third thing I would tell you is commands from God are communicated in the Bible. You cannot know what God is commanding without your Bible. That's why we're told as God's people to not go beyond what is written. We're not handing out commands to each other. God has spoken. His word is inscripturated in your Bible, which leads me to one more one-liner for you. This one's like a whole seminar in a sentence. Old Testament commands not reiterated in the New Testament are accomplished for us in Christ. Did you check that? Old Testament commands in the Old Testament of your Bible before Matthew that are not reiterated in your New Testament are accomplished for us in Christ. Are you tracking with me here? The Old Covenant documents of the law. I don't want everybody wondering which priest they're gonna go to to get their scabs checked, okay? You didn't even know that was a command in your Bible, did you? It's in there. I don't want you checking how many threads are in your shirt. I don't want everybody not trimming the corners of their beard. Go ahead and trim the corners of your beard. And I definitely don't want bacon gone, okay? (laughs) We're sticking with the bacon. 
Because in the old covenant document, which set apart the nation of Israel as the people of God from all the other nations, there were commands given to them. And when you read those commands, when you engage with them, they are not irrelevant. They are totally relevant. They display the character of God's holiness, but they also should for you bring rejoicing in the accomplishment of your savior. Jesus came and filled up every jot and tittle of the law so that we in Christ have all of the laws accomplished through his perfection and then live now in the law of liberty, the New Testament calls it the law of Christ. Does that make sense? So we obey God's commands. I just want you to have it. Communion with God results in obedience to God. Commands from God are loving, good, and in our best interest. Commands from God are communicated in the Bible and Old Testament commands that are not reiterated in the New Testament are accomplished for us in Christ. And last thing, legalism is the danger in this command obedience. Now, if you're unfamiliar with legalism, legalism is the false belief system that I can earn credit or merit with God through my obedience. Just want you to know the Apostle Paul writes whole letters trying to offset this. There is no credit being earned. Nobody's getting into heaven because they worked out their own salvation as in they accomplished it through their good works. It just doesn't work out that way. But there's a second layer to legalism that I call it Christian legalism. Christian legalism is I can improve my position with God through my obedience to God. You cannot, you listen, you cannot improve your position through obedience, nor can you diminish your position through disobedience. Now, in your disobedience, you will be disciplined if, in fact, you are a son or a daughter of God. And God will convict you and lead you by his loving kindness to repentance. That's what's going to happen. A confession of your sin and a pursuit of obedience. But you cannot change your position by your works. Nobody gets a better seat at the table because of their works. So be careful here. Legalism lies around the corner. And for some of you, there has been a thought that if you could just work harder and do more, you would grow. Certainly obedience is one of the complementary disciplines, but it's the second one that will protect you from legalism. So number two, you ready? Jot it down. Growing always includes number two, remembering God's power in us. Obeying God's command to me and remembering God's power to me. It's God's power that is at work in me as one of his people. And the apostle Paul doesn't put a period at the end of verse 12. He puts a comma. And he uses the word for, which sets up the explanation. Because Paul already knows that when he says, hey, you've obeyed as a pattern of your life when I was with you. You do that now when I'm not with you. And you keep working out your own salvation. You keep putting that internal work out on display on the outside of your life. You keep growing that way. You keep obeying. Paul knows immediately what the danger will be. There will be some people who will be like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna bootstrap my way into growing up as a Christian. And Paul's gonna write verse 13 for you. And there's another group of people that are like, I'm never gonna do it. I'm never gonna do it. It's not gonna happen. I've been this way for so long. Verse 13 is also for you. And there are those everywhere in between. There are those who are forgetful. That's why he writes it so we can remember. It's God's power in us. So look at verse 13 and rejoice. For it is God who works in you. And that's plural, y'all. For it is God who works in all y'all. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Oh man, these are good words. These are sweet, hope-filled words of promise. Remembering God's power in me is the second complementary, irreplaceable, and perpetual discipline of all who will grow spiritually. God is at work in the people of God so that they want and do what they wouldn't want and wouldn't do apart from him. The Holy Spirit of God is indwelling us as his people. Listen, the Bible teaches that when we place our faith in Christ in this new covenant, this new agreement, the Spirit of God indwells all of us. Now, this is mind-blowing, but the Spirit of God is in all of us. We have access to and the presence of the entire Holy Spirit in us. And the Bible teaches that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not us getting more of the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit getting more of us. So think of it as getting stuff out of the cup 
so that the water can fill more of the cup. There's a filling and there's a gifting and there's an empowering and there's a guiding. And these are all the things we're gonna unpack in John 14 and John 16. They're coming right up. I just want you to know the Holy Spirit of God is in all of the people of God who have placed their faith in the finished work of the Son of God so that we would be a people who want things and do things that we didn't want and we couldn't do. The things that bring him pleasure. That's what the promise is here. And this is essential for us to remember. We gotta soak in this. We gotta marinate in it. God is with me. God is at work in my life. God is powerfully moving in me to want things that I didn't want and to do things that I couldn't do so that he receives pleasure through my life. Listen, friend, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you don't want anything different than you always wanted, I'm concerned that there may be an illegitimacy to your claim to be a disciple of Jesus because the wants get changed and the juice for the working gets supplied. It's not perfection, but the direction of our lives changes. We must be a people who remember God's power in us. I don't know if you ever watched a commercial that uh, promises you something awesome, some kind of sweet deal. There's some kind of awesome discount that's available for a limited time, always for a limited time. And then at the end, whoever the guy is that talks really fast, I don't know if that's a real guy or if that's like speed up the, anyway, the guy that talks really fast, he, say, he says these words, you know these words, some exclusions may apply, right? You know that? I don't know why, but I always think I'm probably in the exclusions. I think I don't get the deal. I want you to hear with joy and with hope that there are no exclusions to the presence and power of God in the people of God through faith in Jesus Christ. None. You cannot get excluded. You cannot be the exception to the rule. There is only and always for all of us the promise of verse 13 that we must remember that God is at work in us. He made you to be wanting and to be working in a way that further reflects the glory of your Savior so that you look more and more like Christ. You think more and more like Christ. You love more and more like Christ. You have a perspective informed more and more like Christ. You have priorities that are shaped by Jesus Christ. No exclusions apply. For us as a church family, some of you, it's hard to believe right now that the power of God is at work in you to want and to do. Cling to the promise, the faithful promise of verse 13. I am in Christ, therefore I have from God power working in me to want and to work, and therefore I do in obedience to his commands. So growing together as a church family will include each of us becoming more and more convinced of who we are in Christ and what God has supplied for us as his people in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the context, even in the circumstances and in the context in which we live. With the cultural pressure, with the impending persecution, with the besetting sins, Hebrews calls them, the sins that are in our flesh the most, they have the most, they have the most hold on us, those besetting sins as we fight in all of that, God's power is at work in me to want and to do what would bring him pleasure. So there's two ways to fall off the horse. Independent sweating. <laughs> I'm just gonna gut it out and I'm gonna grow. I'm gonna do everything and I'm gonna grow. Oh, you can do everything. I just don't know if you're gonna grow. The other side of the horse to fall off on, the enemy's fine with us falling off on either side, is I'm gonna think about, and I'm gonna think about, and I'm gonna dwell on, and I'm just gonna meditate on, but there's no impact on my life. I'm just, I'm just being, I'm gonna be. The New Testament has no, no grid for that either. Oh, it's both. It's gotta stay together. It's got to stay together. We have what is true about us, therefore we live in obedience to what God has commanded us, okay? This is across the board and varied in every expression. If you, if you think of the grammar terms for this, this is the indicatives are what is true, statements of fact, and the imperatives, the commands of the Bible for our lives. And you'll find people who wanna divide those. 
And they'll say, well, I just kind of live in what is true about me. I, I, don't, I don't like all these imperative things. I'm just gonna live in the indicatives. And then you got people over here like, imperatives, imperatives, imperatives. Do it, do it. And you're just like, man, this is heavy. Yeah, put them together, put them together. And the life that grows spiritually is marked by confidence in the indicatives that leads and empowers obedience to the imperatives. That's how we grow. That's what's supposed to be taking place in the rhythms of our life together. Separate them and you have massive problems. If legalism is the danger on obeying, license is the danger on remembering. License is the danger. The idea that there is being a believer without obeying the Messiah. That there is discipleship without obedience. So therefore I can begin with Christ. I'm safe. I, I grew up hearing this called fire insurance. I've got fire insurance, but it has no effect on my life. I'm just living my life the way I always did for the same purposes I always did. No, no, no. He who began a good work in you, the work he began in you was making you alive in order to lead you toward likeness to himself. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. Don't allow legalism to creep in and crush it wherever you see it, in your own heart. And don't allow licentiousness or license to creep in. Listen, here's a verse that we need. If you're taking notes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 Thess 5, 14. The Apostle Paul says there that we're gonna have to live as we grow together, admonishing the idols. Sometimes we're gonna have to tell people to get moving. Encouraging the faint-hearted. Encourage means put courage in. There are gonna be people who are not courageous and we're gonna come alongside and speak courage into them through the promises of God. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Do you know what growing up together is gonna mean for us? It's gonna mean sometimes our arm is around somebody who is supporting part of our body weight while we walk forward through this life. That's what it's gonna mean, helping the weak. That's what it's gonna take. And the last part is the most important part, patient with them all. Loved ones, listen, our desire is not for this to be a year of us evaluating each other's growth. Oh, Steve, I thought you were gonna go to level six. I <laughs> To be honest with you, buddy, I think you slid back to level four. I don't know what's going on here. Are you in the rhythms? It's not what we're here for. We're here for a joyful, hopeful walk together toward true spiritual growth, which does include obedience and the indicative of remembering God's power in us. Dependent obedience is the way of growing spiritually two perpetual, complementary, and irreplaceable disciplines. Got it? May God use every rhythm of our life together this coming year. Whether you're new or old with us, whether you are a veteran or a new follower of Jesus, whether you've been growing like crazy and you know it spiritually, or you have distant memories of growing up spiritually. It's been like since college retreat. Last major move God did in your life, it's been a long time. Whatever the case, you're suffering and hanging on by a thread or you're thriving, experientially and life seems easy. Whatever the case, let's be growing together. All right, we learn in order to live. So let me give you some stuff to take home. Number one question is, what is my current spiritual status? That's gonna require humility on our parts and honesty, but I think we need to address it. Some of you may not have any evidence that you are alive spiritually. So I wanna encourage you. I want to remind you that the offer of the gospel is for you to believe and you will be saved. You'll be rescued. Your spiritual status, if you don't have Christ, is condemned and spiritually dead. And the offer of the gospel is for you, just like it was for us. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, every people group, every cultural background, every story, every socioeconomic grouping, every age, the offer stands. If you'll run to him, don't get religious. Don't try to do good works to work it out or work it into being true. Set aside all the effort and run to Christ confessing your sin and place your faith in him and he will save you and you will begin to grow together with a new status. Church family, it's gonna require humility on our parts to say where we really are. Some of you have been acting like you're somebody you're not. You've been acting like you don't need to grow when you absolutely know you need to grow. You've been unwilling to say it because you've walked so long with certain people that you think about what they think about you far more than you think about what is true about you. 
So let's let our groups this coming year, let's let our coffee meetings, let's let our studies be places where we humble ourselves and we're honest and we mutually encourage one another in that, okay? James chapter four promises that where we humble ourselves, grace will flood in. He gives more grace. Number two, where is my best opportunity for growth? This is the eval part. I think the Spirit's probably putting his finger on some stuff right now for some. Perhaps the indicatives have drifted away. Your mind has not been filled with the truths of the gospel about you and for you. Perhaps obedience is the issue and disobedience has been the pattern. I don't know. But I know that if we will seek the Lord for areas of growth, they will become obvious to us. And lastly, number three, who can I invite into growth with me? Who can we bring from our community into growing with us? You're not inviting people to your perfection club. You're inviting people into your growth as followers of Christ. So be careful with your neighbors and your coworkers as you talk about your life with Jesus that you present them with the opportunity to come in amongst a growing church family. Not numerically, it's not what I mean. Growing together church family so that they might meet Christ and develop as Christ followers themselves. Heads of household. Let's lead our families to be growing. Let's tell our families we wanna grow. And as heads of household, we wanna lead the way to growth spiritually. Humble yourselves. And then finally, inside of our church family, where can we encourage one another? Some of you know people that seem to have no interest in growth inside of our church family, for whatever reason. Would you invite them along with you to be growing with you? Would you ask them to come and serve on your team? Would you ask them to be in your group? Would you ask them to go to the study with you so that they could be growing with you? Let's pursue one another for the sake of growing together. Growing always includes obeying and remembering. Fall off on either side of that and you will have an appearance of maturity without the substance of true growth, okay? Which reminds me of the Palo Verde trees. It's our state tree. My neighborhood is named for the Palo Verde tree. I don't speak Spanish, but it means green stick. You know about the Palo Verdes, all those green trees out there? The Palo Verdes in the suburbs don't look like the Palo Verdes that are native to the Sonora Desert. The Palo Verdes in the desert are shorter, stumpier, and far deeper in their roots. They don't get a lot of water, so they go chasing it. And when the monsoon hits the Sonora Desert, those little Palo Verdes hold. But out here in the burbs, We feed those babies. I mean, we give it to them. We got sprinkler systems set up. There's more water than they could ever fathom. And they grow fast. They look big and strong. Palo Verde trunks, big Palo Verde trees. And do you know the number one casualty in the monsoon season? Palo Verde trees. That wind hits them. Their root system has not gone deep searching for the water. They have an appearance of maturity that does not actually come with the substance of true growth as they were made to grow. I don't want to be a Palo Verde in the suburbs church family. I don't want to be a Palo Verde in the suburbs disciple of Jesus. And I don't want you to be one either. So what I want to invite us to do, I want to do something a little bit different before we take communion together. How many of you grew up with churches that did an altar call in your church services. How many of you grew up around that? We're not doing that. (laughs) But I am gonna invite you to respond because I think the Spirit of God is putting his finger on some of us who have stagnated in our growth, who have started to doubt that growth is possible. Some of us know directly what's keeping us from growing as we should be growing because it's a sin issue, it's right there. And what I wanna invite you to do is not come forward and, but if the Spirit of God has his finger on you in a particular way, I wanna invite you to posture yourself in consecration him, to devote yourself, to dedicate your life again to him for growth spiritually in this coming ministry year, okay? And I wanna encourage you to do that by just 
having you turn around and kneel down with your knees at your seat. And I'm gonna kneel down up here because the Spirit has his finger on me. He's had it on me for a couple months knowing this is where we were going. I wanna grow. I wanna really grow. I wanna grow down so that when the storms hit, I hold. Some of you are such testimonies of holding in the storm and I just want your root system to get deeper and deeper. Some of you, I'm scared that we are Palo Verdes in the suburbs. So if the Spirit has his hand on you, I'm not coercing this, but I'm gonna kneel down here. You turn around and kneel down there at your seat and I'm gonna pray. We're gonna consecrate our lives to growth for this coming year. If you join me in that, that would be great. Oh, Father, we need to grow. We are not what we will be one day, but we are not what we used to be either. So I pray in faith and ask that you would take our lives and you would shake them up, that you would meet with us powerfully again, that we would know your presence, maybe like we once did, that we would meet you in the quiet time of devotion with you. We would meet you in the commute. Your word would come powerfully crashing into our lives, that your spirit would direct our steps and grant us wisdom. God, we are posturing here on our knees because we desire for you to do what you have done in the past again. For some, for you to keep doing it, keep growing us into likeness to Jesus. For some, start, start again in us. We're, we're submitting to you. We're confessing, we're repenting, we're turning. God, we look to you because you told us that you are in us, working powerfully to want these things and to do them. So we trust you as we step forward and obey you. Help us not to divide those. And may you receive the glory in all the context, all the circumstances of our church family in this coming year. May there be a story of growing together. Deeper. Stronger. More tender. More courageous with the gospel so that you receive glory through Christ church. We ask for that in Jesus' name. If we can agree together in that consecration, can we say amen? Amen.